Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls of all ages, there are a couple of seats up front which are reserved for VIPs, which is uh, referring to anybody who is not sitting down right now. So <laughs> by coming late, you become an RS an, a VIP. Now, please help yourself. If you'd like a better seat, feel free to move up. Just don't take the one marked Brian Keating, because that is my name, and I am the co-associate director. We such a big job, we need two associate directors, and I am one half of the dynamic duo. The other half is Dr. Eric Viri, PhD, MD, who uh, is also a very curious soul, and he is uh, he sends regards from running one of his many programs and seeing one of his many patients, I'm sure. Uh, but tonight, it is a pleasure to welcome another fellow. You know, Eric's a real doctor, but you know, myself, I'm not, and Mario's not, as far as I know, a real doctor in terms of actually helping people with their physical maladies, but he does help us with our mental maladies. So tonight, I'm quite honored to have him here. I just want to say a couple words about the Clark Center before introducing Dr. Mario Livio. And that is that we uh, have come to the conclusion of our 2017-2018 program, but fear not, we have many programs online uh, that we have taped from previous, uh, uh, from previous events, including an event here held with uh, the physics girl, Diana Cowren, and, and PhD Comics, uh, Jorge Cham. And that is available online, and there are other events, including an event by a reasonably unknown astronomer named Brian Keating, who did a book event uh, about a month and a half ago, also as part of the Clark Center and the UC Library System. So there's events online, but we also have a podcast. And uh, you know, tonight's event is free, uh, except for you. No, no, it's also it's totally free, and we do all of our programming for free. Uh, but one thing that would help us out tremendously is for as many of you as possible to subscribe to our podcast, which is available at our website and on Apple and on Google Play Store as the Into the Impossible podcast. So if you can look that up, download it, rate it, give it five stars or whatever the maximum is allowable. Uh, with great inflation, that would be a tremendous help to us to give the algorithms and AI and robots that do these kinds of calculations uh, some heads up that we are doing an interesting and important job here in San Diego and beyond. And that is to stoke the nascent uh, fuel and fan the fires of curiosity, imagination, and creativity. So today I was <clears throat> had the pleasure to interview Mario on the subject of his book, his latest book, and some of his past books. And uh, that will be available in the next couple of weeks, as will this event as well. So I hope you guys will check out our podcast, Into the Impossible, on our website. Stay tuned for upcoming events. We hold a writer's workshop as part of the Clarion Writer's Workshop, the esteemed Clarion Writer's Workshop. Uh, that's held on campus every year. And we may have a couple of, uh, of, of events that we pop up throughout the summer, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Mario was worried that the crowd turnout would be small because, as you know, there is a big event going on tonight in North Korea, no, in Singapore. And <laughs> I said that the only Kim that we care about here is Kim Kardashian, okay, because she's from Southern California. She's a fellow Southern California. So if, if, if Mario gets an urgent text, uh, you know, that he has to advise the president on how to interact with the uh, premier of North Korea, we'll have to make uh, allowances for that. But hopefully all will go well, and we won't need to, uh, to, <clears throat> to take precautions for nuclear uh, events. But, <laughs> but uh, Mario Olivio is actually a, a real hero of mine. He's influenced me so much that I had to actually stop reading one of his six books. Uh, I thought you had more books than that, but is it six books? Six books. Six books, okay. Six popular books, which is a heroic undertaking um, <coughs> by any stretch of the imagination. And I told him today I had to stop reading one of his books out of fear that I would uh, be plagiarizing him in my own book uh, because he's such a talented writer and such a gifted raconteur of stories that make physics and science and math and the imagination a personal story. And I think that's what's so exciting about what he's going to discuss tonight. So let me read his official bio which reads like this. Dr. Mario Olivio is an internationally known astrophysicist, a best-selling author, and a popular speaker. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, who worked for 24 years with the Hubble Space Telescope. He has published more than 400 scientific papers on topics ranging from dark energy and cosmology to black holes and extrasolar planets. Dr. Livio is also the author of six popular science books, including The Golden Ratio, which is an international bestseller for which he received the Piano Prize and the International Pythagoras Prize, 
And another book, Is God a Mathematician, that was the basis of the 2016 Emmy-nominated television program produced by NOVA called The Great Math Mystery. These are fantastic uh, episodes from that NOVA special. Livio's book, Brilliant Blunders, the one that influenced me to almost plagiarize it, uh, was a national bestseller in the United States and was selected by the Washington Post as one of the best books of the year. His newest book, Why, What Makes Us Curious, appeared in the United States in July 2017 and last week went into paperback publication, which reminds me to tell you that in addition to following delicious uh, hors d'oeuvres and, and refreshments after this conversation, we're going to, uh, after we hear Mario's presentation, then he and I will call upon members of the audience to ask him questions, which he will answer. Uh, after that, we'll have refreshments, and then he will sign these paperbacks, which are fresh off the presses. So literally, please join me in giving a warm San Diego round of applause for Dr. Mario Olivier. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I can say it's a real pleasure to be here. I mean, the weather is just phenomenal. And uh, yes, uh, compared to Baltimore, it's uh, certainly pretty amazing. Um, I owe you two short explanations before I start the actual talk. One is that I'm not standing at the podium. I have ADHD, so I walk all the time. In fact, my wife who sits here can tell you that she gets dizzy when she speaks to me. Um, <laughs> The, the second thing is uh, an explanation is how come that as an astrophysicist I wrote a book about human curiosity which sounds more like this belongs to psychology or neuroscience. And the answer is that it does belong to psychology and neuroscience. Uh, but the explanation is that simply that I always was and still am an extraordinarily curious person. And a little over five years ago, I just became extraordinarily curious about curiosity itself. Uh, and so I spent about five years um, reading uh, literally hundreds, maybe, maybe even a thousand papers that have been done on research on curiosity in neuroscience and psychology. I interviewed many researchers in this field, visited labs and so on. And this is how this book came about, why? Um, so uh, that's why I'm talking about this. Uh, now, in case you're curious what this uh, uh, abstract piece of art is, uh, it's really nothing except that uh, it hides within it uh, the question mark that appears on the cover of the book. Um, so that's all. So let's start about curiosity. And I will start with uh, the same thing that I start the book with, uh, which is this American author, Kate Chopin, who lived in the 19th century. Um, she lived most of her life in Louisiana. And she wrote mostly short stories, although she wrote a couple of novels as well. Um, and in particular, as I was writing the book, I hit upon this one short story that she wrote, which is called The Story of an Hour. Uh, it's a very short story. You see, when it was published in 1894, it, the whole story actually fit on less than one page of Vogue, which you what you see there. Uh, so it is a truly short story, a story of an hour. Uh, she was married to Oscar Chopin, this person here who was of French descent. And this is the house in which she lived for many years in, in Louisiana. Uh, the story is a fantastic story in itself, but it starts with an amazing sentence. And this is the sentence. Knowing that Mrs. Mullard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. Now, you can hardly start a short story with a better sentence than this. I mean, this is such a fantastic sentence. It captures in one line, it captures death human frailty, you know, all that. You immediately want to read more. Uh, and that is her great gift. She can generate intellectual curiosity with every single sentence she writes. I wish I could write like that. Uh, by the way, in the background, you can barely see here, there is Kate Chopin there with four of her children. There are two biographies for, of Kate Chopin online. One of them says she had six children. The other one says she had seven. Um, 
I'm absolutely convinced that she knew exactly how many children she had, <laughs> but apparently her biographers didn't. Um, but let's move to curiosity. So there was this British-Canadian psychologist named Daniel Berline, and he tried to map curiosity onto the two-dimensional plane with two axes like this, and he gave names to various types of curiosity. Now, these are not the only types of curiosity that exist, but these are very major ones, and it, it is a good, you know, it's a good start to start with a plot like this. Now, let me explain to you what each one of those means. So you see, one axis runs from perceptual curiosity to epistemic curiosity. What are these things? Perceptual curiosity is the curiosity we feel when we see something that either catches us by surprise or puzzles us or it's ambiguous. We don't know whether it's this or that or what. It's what these kids here feel when they see a white girl for the very first time in their lives. The faces that you see, this is the face of perceptual curiosity. You see, until this second, these kids in a remote village didn't even know that such a thing exists as this young girl here. That's perceptual curiosity. Epistemic curiosity is the curiosity, it's the love of knowledge. It's what philosopher Thomas Hobbes called the lust of the mind. It is what drives all scientific research. It drives the best works of art. It drives all the big why questions and the how questions. It's what you see on the faces of these kids when shown plants that grow scientific experiments and they have to think, oh, whoa, why do they grow like this? How do they grow like this? And so on. That's epistemic curiosity. On the other axis, it went from diversive curiosity to specific curiosity. What is diversive curiosity? Diversive curiosity is what these kids here are doing. These are Dutch kids. They sit in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam next to one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. This is Rembrandt's The Night Watch. But they are all on their cell phones. <coughs> Diversive curiosity is what drives people to constantly look for text messages or people who wait cannot wait until the new iPhone appears, or things like that. Now, by the way, I, I showed this picture to a number of people, and there is a claim that uh, these kids were actually reading a Wikipedia article about <laughs> this painting. Now, that may be true, but even if that is true, that's also wrong because they should the, we read the Wikipedia article at home. When they are next to the painting, they should look at the painting. <laughs> now, uh, believe it or not, this very same painting, Rembrandt's The Night Watch, but under completely different circumstances. You see here, I gave it as an example of diversive curiosity. But under completely different circumstances, it generated a lot of perceptual curiosity, that curiosity that when you're surprised. And I want to show you that now, those circumstances. But please don't be alarmed. There will be a sound that sounds a bit like an alarm. OK? So here it is. This is a Dutch Shoppers in the Dutch city of Breda get more than they bargained for after actors storm the shopping center dressed in 17th century outfits. Abseiling from ropes and jumping from balconies, the group was staging a reconstruction of Rembrandt's painting, The Night Watch, to promote the reopening of the Rijksmuseum. So 
the Rijksmuseum was closed for two years for renovations. And uh, when it reopened, they wanted to advertise the fact that they, it opened. And they generated this flash mob at this mall in Breda uh, to generate this. So you saw uh, this perceptual curiosity with the same painting. Finally, on the other side of that axis, there was specific curiosity. Specific curiosity is when you're curious about a very specific piece of information, like, you know, uh, uh, who wrote it? The, who was it that wrote uh, The Old Man in the Sea? Or uh, what was the name of that actress we saw in that movie last week, you know, and so on? That's the thing. Or, uh, you know, who is this, uh, for example? Who is this? I, I, gave, a, I gave a hint. Hemingway? Hemingway, yes. It's, yeah, it's I. Yeah, I, I, I gave a, I gave a, I gave a hint by asking who wrote The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, so yeah, it's Hemingway in Milan in uh, 1918, I think. Um, okay, so we have the, these definitions of uh, the, the different types of curiosity, uh, but now let's move on. And. One other thing I did was I chose two people <coughs> from history that I regard as two of the most curious people to have ever been. And I studied them at some depth in order to see if there is anything that can be learned from the fact that they are as curious as they were. So one of them was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo, of course, you know, he, he did everything. You know, he, he did art. He left us notes. Uh, you know, they were about probably in his life. He probably wrote about fifteen thousand pages with notes, uh, of, of which about seventy-two hundred survived. Um, he, he, he worked on every topic in engineering, in science, in whatnot. In you know, why is the sky blue? Uh, uh, how do you do something like this to this? How, why, how do you build a flying machine and all that stuff? And you look at his notebooks today, and they look something like this. Uh, the notes, by the way, themselves, like you see the notes there on the left, they were all written. He was left-handed. He was writing it from right to left and in mirror image. So to be able to read that, you have to hold a mirror to the page in order to be able to read. So if you read, for example, there, uh, what, what are the notes? The notes typically are what he planned to think about that day or solve that day. You know, why is the sky blue? Or you know, what is the length of the tongue of the woodpecker? Or you know, the, every question interests him. Uh, and when you look at these pages, at first, the, the, well, then there are the drawings, of course. And, the drawings, at first, they look a little bit like a random collection of doodles. But when you look a little bit more carefully, you start to see some order in this madness. It's not exactly order. It's how his mind worked. So it probably worked something like this. He would start with thinking about something like maybe the flow of water, which is a topic that he worked on a lot. And so he would draw that thing at the top there. But then, you see, he was a very visual person. So to him, once he drew that wave, kind of, he would think, OK, so where else do I see forms like this in nature? And then he would think, ah, maybe I see it in clouds, you see on the right here. Or maybe in the hair of that old gentleman that he drew in the middle. Or maybe in the plant here, the, the way the leaves go, and so And that's how he would sort of go from one thing to the next and think about, you know, is there something common to all these different phenomena? Of course, in the middle, he would also do some mathematics in which he was rather weak, I must say. Uh, in this part, on this particular page, he tries to solve the famous problem of squaring the circle, you know, and so on. It never succeeded, and it actually has no solution. So, uh, yes. Now, was there any topic that he wasn't interested in? Yes, there was one, politics. He was not interested in politics at all. And this was a very wise decision on his part, 
because he lived at the time of the Borgias, and they basically killed everyone who was interested in politics. <laughs> <coughs> Leonardo, on the other hand, actually managed to get funded by them. So clearly, he was very smart. Uh, one topic that, to which he devoted a lot of time was anatomy. And his pages on anatomy look something like this. In this case, he studies the operation of the heart. This is the heart of an ox, actually. Um, and again, you see the notes, and you see all these things. He actually discovered things like the atria, which were not known before his time. He also thought about uh, why do we have fever, and how is that related to the flow of the blood, and things like that. Uh, he did not discover the circulation of the blood. That was done by William Harvey uh, quite a bit later. Uh, and the reason for that was probably because he actually never dissected a live human being. So he never saw the heart while it was working and pumping the blood. Uh, but overall, pretty amazing, as, as you can see, and uh, discovered many things. The second person that I decided to study at some detail was Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is, of course, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. Uh, a person who worked, well, Nobel laureate and everything, a person who worked in uh, every area of physics, uh, a person who actually did not even prioritize problems in physics. One day he could work on uh, quantum theory of electrodynamics, and the next day on what is it that makes uh, certain uh, surfaces uh, shine, you know, things like this. To him, everything was interesting, uh, the way the candle works and things like that. Um, but in addition to being this incredible physicist, he was also interested in many, many other things. He was a he was a superb bongo drummer. He actually went to Brazil to study drumming. Uh, he was interested, actually, in drawing. He had his friend, Jerry Zorthian, who, whom he asked uh, to teach him how to draw. And they reached this agreement that one Sunday he would teach Zorthian physics, and the next Sunday Zorthian would teach him how to draw. After about a year like that, he actually became a decent drawer. Uh, Zorthian didn't learn that much physics, but, uh, but, but you know, it was still very interesting. He, he was a world expert in safe cracking. Uh, he was an expert in Mayan hieroglyphs. Um, he, he really was a, a person who was interested also in everything. And if you look at his notebooks, he also had notebooks. They looked something like this. And you look at these notebooks, and the mathematics is, of course, much more advanced than uh, Leonardo's. The drawing is much less advanced than Leonardo's. But overall, you're left with the same kind of impression from his notebooks and Leonardo's notebooks. I mean, you sort of have a feeling that, you know, how their mind jumped from this to that to that to that, you know, and so on. So yes, truly unusual people. Let's go to th actual theories of curiosity. So one uh, influential theory has been called the information gap theory. So this was formulated by a, a, a researcher that is still very active at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, George Lowenstein. And he suggested this information gap theory. What does this theory say? It says that when we see something that puzzles us or is ambiguous and so on, a gap is formed in our mind. And that gap is felt as an unpleasant, as an aversive feeling. And that what curiosity does is we try to bridge that gap in order to get out of this unpleasant feeling. That's his theory. Now, this is a good theory for some forms of curiosity, in particular perceptual curiosity and specific curiosity. I'm sure that many of you who are either puzzled by something or who try to remember you know, the name of the actress in that movie and so on, know how bad that can feel you know, when you cannot remember that and you, you know, say, well, I don't know the name. You know, it, it, it agonizes you. Uh, so, that certainly works. On the other hand, 
epistemic curiosity, that love of knowledge, wanting to learn, we don't quite feel that as an unpleasant feeling. We actually feel that as an anticipation of reward, really. So clearly, uh, Lowenstein's theory captures some aspects of some types of curiosity, but not, it's not a comprehensive theory of really everything. Now, one as interesting aspect uh, of, of the information gap theory is this inverted U-shape or parabola shape when you plot curiosity in a certain subject as a function of your knowledge in that same subject. So what does this plot tell us? It says the following, that when we know about something very, very little, we're not that curious about this. Because we don't know what to be curious about. When we know about this subject a lot, we're also not very curious about this. Because we feel that we more or less know everything there is to be known. When do we really get curious? It's in the middle here. This is when, <coughs> excuse me, we know quite a bit, but we know or feel that there is much more to be learned. That's when we get really curious. This is why, why, by the way, when you hear somebody talking on their cell phone, that is much more distracting than if you hear two people talking. It's, it's when you hear just half of the conversation and you cannot follow the flow of the conversation, that's much more distracting. This is why on trains, for example, you see lots of people with their headphones on because they cannot stand this thing of hearing people, you know, talking just these half a logs, they can drive you nuts. You cannot stop trying to listen to what's going on. So that's the information gap. Now, oddly enough, uh, a former Secretary of Defense, who didn't speak at all about curiosity, captured this shape of, of this inverted U shape, but talking about something completely different. Um, so this is uh, a press conference that was uh, prior to the Iraq war. And um, what happened was that in that press conference, uh, he was asked, this is Donald Rumsfeld, and he was asked, what does he have to say about the fact that there is no evidence that Iraq, Iraq is transferring weapons of mass destruction to terrorist organization? In answer to this very specific question in a press conference, Rumsfeld answered. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. This was his answer. Now, I want to, to emphasize that his sentence is completely correct, logically speaking. There are known knowns, there are things we know we know, there are known unknowns, there are things we know, and there are unknown unknowns. It's just as an answer to that specific question, it's a little bit bizarre. <laughs> and, and as a result, there is a British organization that gives every year the foot in the mouth award. <laughs> and he got it for this particular comment for that year. Uh, as the most baffling statement by a politician. Uh, in the, in the, when they awarded him the, the foot in the mouth award, they said that we think we know what he meant, but we're not sure we know we know. Uh, <laughs> by the way, the runner-up, the runner-up that year for the prize was a former governor of yours, uh, and who I thought should have actually won. Because, you see, Rumsfeld's sentence was actually at least logically correct, even though it had nothing to do with the question. But it, it was logically correct. Arnold Schwarzenegger was uh, the runner-up with his statement that, I think that gay marriages is a matter between a man and his wife. <laughs> 
that year. So uh, I, I thought he should have won that. OK, uh, but of course, when he talked, it had nothing to do with, with curiosity. Uh, what about uh, neuroscience? So there are many experiments now. There once weren't very many. Now there are many more experiments in neuroscience. Uh, and this is an experiment done by a, a neuroscientist, uh, Marike Yepma. She's from Holland. And what they did is um, they took people and they made them perceptually curious. Again, that's the thing when you see something ambiguous and so on. And they made them perceptually curious by showing them blurred images of known objects, like, for example, that accordion up there. And you know, asking them how curious they are to know what that thing is, and so on. And then showing them a clear image of the same object. And sometimes confusing them, and like in the second row, showing them a clear image of something else, that not the blur, not the blur, and all kinds of things like that. But that's the general idea. But this is where the neuroscience comes in. They took the people and stuck them into MRI machines and did functional MRI on their brains while they made them curious like this in order to see which areas of their brain are being activated when they are perceptually curious. And what they discovered was that when we are perceptually curious, the area of the brain that's activated is indeed an area that is typically associated with conflict or with hunger and you know, with, with an unpleasant feeling. So in this sense, the neuroscience confirmed the suggestion from psychology that at least in the case of perceptual curiosity, that is felt as an aversive state. So that was a very important thing. By the way, I just seeing that accordion up there, I, it reminds me of this story that there was this guy who was driving in his car and he had this accordion on the back seat and he had to stop somewhere, go for half an hour. And he, and he hesitated whether to leave the accordion on the back seat because it was seen from the outside and so on. At the end, decided to leave it there. He went for half an hour, came back, and indeed somebody broke the window of his car and threw a second accordion on the back seat. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I told this story. I, I, I have this, uh, I have this dubious distinction of being also the science advisor to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And I told this story to, to a friend of mine who is uh, one of their chief violinists. And she told me, we tell this story about a vi viola. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, another, uh, this is just the inverted u shape. Uh, a, a second person named Kang uh, did a different experiment at Caltech. Uh, and this was to test for epistemic curiosity. So this, I remind you, this is the love of knowledge, the learning new things. Uh, and again, they did it with functional MRI. And the way they uh, generated the epistemic curiosity was by asking the people questions, a series of questions. So uh, like, uh, which musical instrument was invented to sound like a human voice, for example? Does anybody know by that? No, it's the violin, but yeah, it's the violin, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a New York friend who tries to convince me it's the trombone, but it's not, it's the violin. Uh, so anyhow, so questions like this, or you know, or to which galaxy does the solar system belong? Milky Way. Yes, yes, the Milky Way. So questions like this make them epistemically curious and see again. Now what they found in this case was that the areas that were activated are actually exactly the areas that are associated with anticipation of reward. This is what areas that are activated when people offer you chocolate, or when you, know, you wanted to see a play for a long time and you're finally sitting there waiting for the curtain to go up. So basically, perceptual curiosity and epistemic curiosity are very different both in terms of your psychological state, one is felt as an aversive state, the other one is felt as anticipation of reward, and indeed in terms of which areas of the brain they activate. 
In fact, they are so different in that sense that I would almost am inclined to suggest that had we actually known this in advance, we might have even not used the same word, curiosity, to describe both of these sensations. I mean, it, you know, may, maybe we'd have used interest for one and, I don't know, anxiety for the other or something else like that. Uh, but but that's, that's the thing. All the experiments I described so far were done with adults. Uh, in fact, there used to be a joke in psychological circles that all experiments in psychology are done with freshmen or sophomore students, and therefore all the findings only apply to that demographic. <laughs> but in recent years, this is beginning to change, and they are doing now experiments with very young children, and I mean very young, even you know, 14 months old children and so on. And I want to show you now two such experiments of the many that I not by now have been done with young children. So in the first experiment that I will show you, the researcher shows a young kid. Now, you know, for kids, they usually blur their faces, so I, I cannot tell for sure if it's a boy or a girl. My feeling is it's a girl, but I, I don't, I'm not really sure. Uh, so, but I'll call her a girl, okay, just to make things simple. So she so, shows the, the kid some sort of a toy that when she presses the button, it does a certain noise. And then you will see what happens after that. Wow, did you see that? Let me show you again, okay? One, two, three, go! Wow, that's pretty cool, huh? All right, you know what? See these toys? I'm gonna put this one right over here, and I'm gonna give you this toy. You can go ahead and play. So that's one experiment. The second experiment was more complicated. <coughs> it was done with three groups of kids, but let me concentrate on two. Uh, one group of kids was smaller kids, uh, maybe average age, maybe five or so. Uh, and the other group was uh, older kids, maybe average age seven or so. Um, so the kids were shown this poll and this asymmetric blue object, and they were asked to actually try to put the blue object on the pole so that the blue thing is in equilibrium, okay? So it turns out that on the average, the smaller kids tend to think that the thing should be in equilibrium in the geometrical center, like this, while the older kids, who know by now a little bit more, tend to think that the center of mass should be closer to the heavier edge, so like in the top right there, and so on. But what the researchers did is they asked the kid to place it so it would be in equilibrium, and they watched what the kids were trying to do. But before they actually put it there, the researchers grabbed the thing, and didn't allow them to actually put it there. But by doing this, they knew and they formed a group of kids from whom they knew that their theory is that it should be at the center, geometrical center, and there is a group of kids for whom the theory is that it is closer to the heavier object. Then they showed the kids the thing in equilibrium, let's say like this. If the kids see it like this, then for those who wanted to put it like this, this is just confirming their theory. For those who wanted to put it like that, that violates their theory. It turned out that for those who 
it confirmed their theory, the kids were no longer interested in this. They looked for a different toy. For the kids where it violated their theory, they wanted to examine the thing more and do their things. And then they do the same thing with the other configuration. You know, again, this was confirming to the ones who wanted to put it there, violating to the ones who wanted to put it in the middle. Now, they also did more complicated things, like eventually they showed the kids that the thing was held in place with a magnet anyhow. <laughs> and once the kids learned that, they, even those who, that they, it violated their theories were no longer interested because there was a different explanation for the whole thing. Basically, from all of these experiments, what the researchers found is that kids very early on, at young ages, they are very, very interested in cause and effect. They understand very early on that every effect has some cause that's linked to it. And they want to understand these connections. And that's, we can understand that because that helps kids you know, cope with their environment by understanding cause and effect and all that. So that is uh, you know, what, what they found here. Um, OK. How did we get to where we are today? You know, this is a bunch of gorillas here. And uh, if you look at uh, humans versus animals, animals are curious too. But there is a basic difference between the curiosity of humans and the curiosity of animals. Animals are not interested in why questions, especially about unseen causes. How do I know that? How do we know that animals, how do I know that chimpanzees don't ask why all the time? Well, we actually know that because it was shown by direct experiments. What kind of experiments? I'll give you an example to one of those. They took <coughs> a bunch of four-year-old kids and a whole bunch of chimpanzees. And they gave them an object that looked completely symmetrical and asked them to place it to stand in equilibrium. But unbeknownst to the children or the chimpanzees, they put some weights inside such that the thing actually couldn't stand. Whatever you did, it kept it fell. It turned out that after a few tries like this, more than 60% of the four-year-olds took the thing in their hands, started examining it, feeling it, you know, and so on. This None of the chimpanzees ever did that. The chimpanzees just kept trying to make it stand, and it kept falling. The chimpanzees were not, did not care why the thing was falling. Now, why is that? What is it that gives us our advantage in this sense? So there is one thing that gives primates, we are, we are primates too, Primates' advantage over all other uh, species, uh, that's the first advantage, which is that we can pack, we pack more neurons in a smaller space. The average human has 86 billion neurons in their brain, and humans have the largest number of neurons in the cerebral cortex, in the striatum. Uh, Chimpanzees, for example, have about a third that. So uh, primates have an advantage over all other species. But what gives the humans the advantage over gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees? So that's a harder question. This is the skeleton of Lucy. This is this pre-human female uh, from about 3.2 million years ago. It was found in Ethiopia. Uh, she probably looked something like this. Uh, maybe <coughs> not my first choice for the prom, but you know, but but still, you know, she was a pre-human. She walked mostly upright. Uh, she ate mostly fruits and vegetables. Um, eh, but the thing is that if you look at the evolution of the uh, size of or weight of the human brain then what happens is, uh, you know, 
If you start from, uh, I don't know, Homo habilis, that's the handyman, the first type of human to make tools. And then you go through Homo erectus, uh, walked on two, and eventually to Homo sapiens. You see that in the last million and a half years or so, uh, the, the size of the brain increased by more than a factor of two uh, in humans. And the question is why? And nobody really knows exactly why. But there are s several theories, and probably it's a combination of a number of those. So one element that probably helped was cooking. Yes, cooking. You know, some of you maybe didn't think cooking was so important. Cooking is great. Because what cooking did is uh, it allowed, first of all, to digest things that before that couldn't be digested. Uh, and also, it allowed to digest them much more easily. So what happened was that, first of all, it cut the number of hours humans spent on chewing from about five to about one hour per day. Uh, it also shortened the guts because the, it was much easier to digest the food. Um, and uh, the guts, the, the human brain uh, consumes about 25% of the energy consumption of the whole body, even though the human brain only weighs about 2% of the weight of the body. Uh, in other animals, it's about only 10%. So our electricity bill of the brain is way higher. And that's directly related to the fact that we have more neurons. That's it. So uh, this is part what, of what happened, because there is a whole balance here between um, how, my, how many hours you can spend foraging for food, uh, how much there is one power law, one function of how does the amount of energy that you can collect relate to body weight, but also how much energy you consume related to body weight, plus the, what the brain consumes. So the combination of cooking, walking upright, which also consumes much less energy than walking on foreign knuckles. Uh, all these types of things, the types of food that you are able to eat. <coughs> you know, they started eating um, bone marrow instead of roots or things like that. All of that actually helped in terms of us getting more efficient energy for the thing and helped this. Now, from my perspective, the interesting thing is that curiosity was played a very interesting role in this feedback of this thing. Because you see, what, what drove Homo habilis to do this, the first tools and so on? This is only curiosity, right? I mean, you know, OK, so he or she took two stones and knocked them against each other and made some sort of a sharp thing. That was great, but what do you do with that? But then, because of curiosity, they discovered that they can take the bone marrow out of the bones with that sharp tool, which they couldn't do before. Or cooking, yes? Cooking. How did cooking start? It probably started by you know, some lightning hitting some forest, and the deer got cooked in the fire, right? And they tasted it. it they said, ah, hmm, not bad. And then they started trying to make fire by themselves. Again, because they were curious about what you can do with these things. So, so what happened is that curiosity fed the thing that they wanted to do. And once they did it, that actually helped increase the number of neurons they could support. OK, from everything I told you so far, you could conclude quite correctly, I think, that curiosity is so important. I mean, you know, it's important for, of course, science. but for education, for art, for every book you read, for every film you see, for every TV program, for advertising, for any conversation, yes? Why should I have a conversation with somebody if I'm not a, a little bit at least curious about what they have to say? <coughs> so it's so, it's so uh, important in our lives that you probably would have thought that at any time in the history of humans, Curiosity was encouraged, right? 
Not quite. Even in fairy tales, these are Hansel and Gretel, the Brothers Grimm. The Brothers Grimm were masters in horror stories for small children. You know, wolves that eat grandmothers and uh, things like that. In, in the case of Hansel and Gretel, you know, they wanted to explore the forest. They wanted to explore the forest. They hit upon this house, which was made of candy. They started nibbling on the roof <coughs> and fell into the hands of a cannibalistic witch. Not exactly an encouragement for curiosity. <laughs> uh, so we have the, these things. But it's not just that. It's not fairy tale, just fairy tales. I mean, we have entire periods in the history of humankind. And, and not just in the Middle Ages. Look, in 1937, the Nazis did the degenerate art. And it's not even just against science. Degenerate art exhibit in Munich, where they took all the great artists of the 20th century, slapped them on walls to convince the people. This is, by the way, Goebbels visiting that exhibit, just trying to convince the masses that all this art was just some Jewish Bolshevik plot against the German people. The, some of the worst cases come in very modern times. The Taliban. The Taliban. So purist, they dynamited all statues last March as blasphemy, including 2,000-year-old stone Buddhas carved into cliffs, an act of cultural destruction denounced throughout the rest of the Muslim world. They dynamited them. You know, works of art, destroy of history, of their own people. And of course, the worst case in this particular story was the attack on Malala Yousafzai, this young Pakistani girl who all she did was to advocate education for young Pakistani girls. She wrote blogs about this. She gave interview to the BBC. And then a Taliban person went on the, her school bus and shot her in the head. This is immediately after she was shot. Luckily, she survived. She went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And last year, started his studies at Oxford University. So this particular story had a good ending. She actually opened the school for girls in Beirut. So, but there were attempts to suppress curiosity. So while writing the book, I coined the phrase of which I was, and still am, very proud. I coined the phrase, Curiosity is the best remedy for fear. What do I mean by that? Look, very often, things we are afraid of or are fearful about are things we are not curious enough about. It's very easy to make us afraid. You know, if I will tell you that all immigrants to this country are terrorists, then you are afraid. But if you are a little bit curious about them, and you try to learn something about what do they do, how it happens, you know, and so on, and you suddenly may discover that this seven-year-old boy who came with his grandmother from Syria after crossing borders on foot is not exactly a terrorist, neither is his grandmother. And you would be much less afraid. So. Curiosity is the best remedy for fear. After having coined this phrase, I discovered, to my delight at some level, that I wasn't even the first to have thought about this. There was an art exhibit in Copenhagen in 2008. And their motto was this, replace fear of the unknown with curiosity. I like my phrase a little bit better, but the <laughs> sentiment, sentiment is, of course, precisely the same. Curiosity is the best remedy for fear. One other thing I did in the book was to interview nine living people who I regard as extraordinarily curious. So I will now just show you who they are. I'll tell you their names, and I'll tell you a few words about a couple of them, OK? So this is Freeman Dyson. 
This is Noam Chomsky. This is Tori Musgrave. This is Fabiola Gianotti, Marilyn Vossavant, Jack Horner, Martin Rees, Brian May, and Vic Muniz. Now, let me tell you a few words about a few of them. Some of you may know Brian May. Brian May is the lead guitarist of the rock band Queen. But those same of you who know that may not know that he's also a PhD in astrophysics, which he finished. He, he went back to do his PhD 33 years after he finished his undergrad in astronomy. You may not know that he was chancellor of John Moore's University in Liverpool. You may not know that he's a world expert in Victorian stereo photography. And you may or may not know that he's a huge activist for animal rights. This is Brian May. I showed you Fabiola Gianotti. She's director general of CERN. That's the European Center for Nuclear Research. She led the group that discovered the Higgs boson. But her first degree was in music. She's an accomplished pianist. She's also an avid cook. So, you know, she has other <laughs> interests as well, as, as, as well as being that. I showed you Jack Horner. Jack Horner is a famous paleontologist from University of Montana. Uh, he was uh, the science advisor to all the Jurassic Park films. Uh, he discovered his first dinosaur skeleton when he was like 13. And he discovered all kinds of things about dinosaurs that we know today and so on. He is extraordinarily dyslexic. So dyslexic that he reads today like a second grader. And I told him, Jack, how can you be such a famous researcher if you cannot read? And he said, you know what? When you do it first, you don't have to read that much. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, now finish by returning to uh, Leonardo, who said once, blinding ignorance does mislead us. Oh, wretched mortals, open your eyes. And to my uh, scientific idol, Albert Einstein, who just kept opening his eyes, here he opens them once and twice <laughs> and thrice. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer some questions. Uh, Brian and I will sit here, and, but I'll, I will, I'll answer some questions, and then I'll go and sign books outside. So please, questions. Please sit, Brian. Maybe I'll stand a little bit to see who has a question. Don't be shy. I'm not here every day, so yes. Yes, so this is, a, I'm not surprised by this question because I was asked that in a couple of other places. So let me tell you what I think about this. So there are many people who have this feeling that young kids are, of course, extremely curious. They can ask a thousand times a day why. And then they go through the school system and somehow they are less curious. So they have a feeling that it's the school system that kills their curiosity. The answer is that that's actually not true in general. Uh, I'm not saying that some particular individual teacher cannot kill curiosity. Yes, they can. But that's not what normally happens. What happens is that studies show that perceptual curiosity, that's when you're surprised and so on. And in particular, um, your preparedness to take risks for novelty decline with age. And that's a natural process. 
with or without that teacher that kills curiosity. So that type of curiosity goes down, and so they ask much less why and so on and so on. But epistemic curiosity, that's the love of knowledge, wanting to learn new things, actually stays very constant with age. So, um, so it's not quite that way. Yes. Yes. So the follow-up to that is what, is, what does this all say about pedagogy, and what do you think is the, is the good kind of pedagogy or educational system? I understand. Is it so let, let, story or, you know, is I understand. I understand. So l let me say I'm not an expert pedagogue. So I, what I say is just based on what I learned from my studies of curiosity. Okay, not not something more than that. Uh, but <coughs> what does that say about what we should do? So one thing we should do, we should um, try to find a way. OK, let me start with something different. Uh, suppose you want to keep kids curious, OK? And you want them, you think that it's very important for them to be curious about that there is the force of gravity and uh, it attracts things and what not. No. You take a six-year-old, tell them there is a force of gravity and this and this, you bore them to tears. You see, that's what, what happens. <laughs> yes, you bore them to tears. But, but, kids of this age very often are, for example, very, very curious, are you, about dinosaurs. Are you curious about dinosaurs? Yes. So, okay. So always start with something they are curious about. All right. Not, don't start with what you think they should be curious about. Start with something you know they are curious about. He mentioned Kim Kardashian. Now, this is, this is no, 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 this is now for adults, not for kids. So, so, some people say, well, you know, uh, my husband is not curious about anything. Not true. All people are curious about something, only sometimes it's not what you think you know, they should be curious about. They may be curious about Kim Kardashian. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of Kim Kardashian. Uh, let's say he's curious about Kim Kardashian, but you think he should be curious about finances. No, fina finances, and I don't know what. Start with Kim Kardashian, that he's already curious about, <coughs> and then say, find a clever way to lead from that curiosity to the things about, let's say, finances. Let, in, 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 in that particular, I'm, I'm saying this off the top of my head. It's not the most clever example. But let, let's suppose you start with Kim Kardashian and say, oh, and you know Kim Kardashian, uh, she married her first husband, and she got a few million dollars to tell her story about the marriage. And then she divorced him four months later, and she got a few million dollars to tell her story <laughs> about the divorce. So. So there is, some, there is some lesson in finances to be learned here, you know? I, I'm serious. I'm serious. Yes, I mean, you know, I didn't make $8 million with all my years in physics, you know? I, so, uh, so, so in the case of, of, of the dinosaurs, you start with the dinosaurs, and you tell them about the dinosaurs, all kinds of things. And, you say, and the dinosaurs, they became extinct some 66 million years ago. And they became extinct because this huge rock, an asteroid, came and hit the Earth. And do you know why this asteroid hit the Earth? Because a force of gravity <laughs> pulled this asteroid towards. So you, you, you understand? So that's that's uh, okay. Yes. Oh, maybe I should sit next to Brian here. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, so first of all, that saying, I, I discuss this a little bit in the book. So that saying comes from about Shakespeare's time. This is when it first appeared. And it appeared not as curiosity killed the cat, but as care killed the cat. And care was meant in, in a way of sorrow or grief. And for some mysterious reason, at the end of the 19th century, uh, the phrase was changed from care killed the cat to curiosity killed the cat. So first of all, originally, it wasn't that phrase at all. Now, 
the, what is meant by curiosity, kill the cat, is an, a, again an attempt to suppress curiosity. And so I, I'm very much against that. Uh, but to say, you know, I, you may know that that phrase has a rejoinder, but satisfaction brought it back. <laughs> so whenever somebody tells you curiosity killed the cat, you say, but satisfaction brought it back. Oh, no, that's, that's not for lack of trying, believe me. That's the question that I'm most curious about, and I've spent half my life working on that problem. But uh, it's, 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 it's just hard, but we will find it. Are, uh, are you saying that the curiosity, you might, you <laughs> might invite them to uh, well, harm us or something? Have, uh, ended themselves because they got too curious and they threw themselves up. No, I don't think that that's the case. I mean, look, I mean, we may kill ourselves with uh, climate change, but uh, it's not because we're very curious. It's just because we're stupid. Uh, yes? Um, I'm curious if there are, I'm curious. That's already good. <laughs> if there were any notable differences in how young boys approach the button exercise and the block exercise versus young girls. No. The, the answer is that there was no gender difference in, the, in, in any of the experiments that were done. Yes, yes. Um, what if they're curious about everything you just said? What if you are curious about everything? That, that, that is good. <laughs> I, I would say that is good. If you're curious about everything I said, yeah. it's, that's great. <laughs> yes. So creativity. Yeah, creativity and invention. Yes. But is there, are there any distinctions? <coughs> yes, there are. Yes, yes, there are. So, uh, so, so um, there was this uh, famous uh, Chicago psychologist. He, he's still alive, but he's now retired. Mihai Csikszent Mihai. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he, he interviewed uh, about 100 very curious people from different, very, very, sorry. I take that back. Very creative people from very different disciplines. And the one thing that he found that was common to all of them across all disciplines was that they were all extraordinarily curious. So curiosity appears to be a necessary ingredient of creativity. And you can even understand that because you see very often very creative people, they are creative because they are able to borrow some things from one discipline and apply it to another, you know, and so on. But being curious is not the same as being creative, because creative implies that you also actually did something. You invented a new domain, or you, know, uh, you changed an existing domain. Uh, so just being curious, you know, if you're curious and you sit at home and you read more books and so on, that's not enough. We'll take a couple more questions, yes. Divergent thinking? Yes. You should be a little bit, we should be a little bit careful with that in the following sense. I mean, and I actually discussed that in the book as well. Uh, I speculate in the book. When I, when I read all the stuff about Leonardo, I, um, I had a feeling, you know, he completed very few projects. He almost could not complete anything. So I said, Maybe he had ADHD. Uh, but then I, no, I'm serious. I, I, I really started thinking about this. But then I thought, but yeah, but on the other hand, he was able to focus on some things and do them very well. So I then consulted with a few ADHD experts, uh, researchers. Um, and what I discovered is that it is very possible with ADHD, if something really interests you, to keep focused on it. And that was found with kids as well. Uh, that <coughs> if, for example, they are very interested in a certain video game, they can stay focused on it, even if they have very s serious ADHD. So 
I, I would say at least they didn't laugh at the idea that maybe Leonardo has ADHD. So basically, so ADHD is a little bit like uh, curiosity on spinning gears. I mean that you know all the time you try to find something else and something new, and so on. so you shouldn't exaggerate you know doing that thing. And also we live in a society where it depends what's important to you. Uh, most of the really successful people, most I would say, um, are rather focused individuals who do one thing and do it well. <coughs> and not so much the Renaissance people. Uh, but um, I, I wrote an article for Scientific American where I argued that maybe it's time to rethink that a little bit in the sense that you know, there is this 10,000 hour myth that if you want to be a specialist in something, you need to spend 10,000 hours on this at least. Um, and that tended to argue that you should focus on one thing because you don't have time to spend more and so on. But we now live longer. We, we live, you know, twice longer than people lived at the time of, of Leonardo. So maybe we have time to spend a few 10,000 hours on a few different things and uh, because there is a lot to be said for you know knowing some different things. I still don't think you should, you know, nobody can know today what Leonardo knew, I mean, uh, but, um, but we can be a little bit more of le Renaissance people than we actually tend to be. Maybe Time one more question. He didn't have the mathematical tools, but he was also not particularly um, talented, I would say, in mathematics. Uh, because, uh, I mean, there were people at his A, at, at his time, that were very strong mathematicians. Niccolò Tartaglia and others who were very strong mathematicians. And Leonardo just wasn't. He, he also didn't get the proper education. That is also true. Because, you know, he was born at Vinci. and. He get, had, had a very sort of rudimentary education at first. Even when he went to, uh, to the atelier, uh, he, he, he learned mostly things how to do, not uh, so much uh, you know, theoretical things. Yes. Uh, maybe one quick one from Jeannie. <coughs> OK. Uh, on the Socratic method. So the Socratic method was very good, I think, in awakening curiosity because, you know, it kept asking things about this and that and everything you could ask again and against. And, and so uh, <laughs> at some level, it's not just the Socratic me me method. It's also, uh, you know, if you like the, the Talmudic uh, thing, you know, in Judaism, it was also a little bit like that where people you know, kept questioning things and, you know, so could, what could they have meant by this and what uh, that and so on. So certainly this was a good way to encourage curiosity. Now, again, you should do everything with a limit uh, because, uh, you know, some people, they con can continue to study the Talmud to death even in the 21st century when maybe they should be spending their their wits, with it because these are some very, very smart people, uh, you know, on something a little bit more productive. But, <coughs> but it's certainly a good way to 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 sharpen your 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 thinking. Yes. Great. So let us wrap with that <coughs> and thank Mario for a very stimulating discussion. And I'll be and, outside signing books. And there will be books to sign and refreshments outside as well. So thank you all for uh, your support of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination and looking forward to seeing more of you next year.